Good morning, everybody. Hi. Thanks for being here. Um, my name is Kevin Carey. I'm the Vice President for Education Policy and Knowledge Management here at New America. Um, this is actually the uh, 20th, our 20th year here at New America. We are celebrating our 20th, uh, 20 years uh, of creating and incubating the next big ideas that address the nation's and world's toughest problems all throughout 2019. Um, and for I would say the majority of those two decades, we've been working in collaboration with Washington Monthly Magazine um, on uh, a variety of projects, including their annual college guide, copies of which you can get in the back if you don't have one already. Um, the goal of the college guide has always been to, in many ways, um, find the important parts of American higher education that people don't appreciate enough. Um, if you're here in Washington or you read the newspaper, uh, there's a lot of attention to the foibles of some of our elite colleges and the people who really, really want their kids to go to them. And there's some good, a great article by uh, Ann Kim, who's going to be one of our panelists uh, today, uh, looking at a kind of a new and fresh angle on that whole set of issues. And um, our staff here at New America have been spending the last 48 hours analyzing the new version of the Higher Education Act. Um, uh, along with uh, a presidential campaign that is probably more chock full of interesting and provocative higher education ideas than any in memory. Um, so it's an important time to be having this discussion. Um, we are, uh, New America itself and also Washington Monthly and, and this uh, effort is uh, supported uh, by the generous support of the Lumina Foundation um, in Indi Indianapolis and I want to acknowledge their support. Um, and we're going to hear this morning from Chauncey Lennon from the uh, Lumina Foundation, who's the Vice President for uh, the Future of Work and Learning. That's a broad mandate. Um, and he's going to be uh, providing some more introductory remarks. And then we'll hear from my uh, good friend and longtime collaborator, Paul Glasters, the Editor-in-Chief of Washington Monthly. So again, thanks to all of you who are watching online. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, Chauncey. Uh, good morning. Um, as Kevin said, I'm Chauncey Lennon. Uh, I'm the Vice President for the Future of Learning and Work at the Lumina Foundation. And it's my privilege to welcome you all here uh, for today's event. Uh, the Lumina Foundation has had the honor of supporting the Washington Monthly College Ranking Guide since 2009. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Lumina, it will come as little surprise that we have invested in this project for the last decade. Um, Lumina seeks to build a stronger nation through equitable, high-quality learning opportunities for all. And for the, about the last 10 years, the Foundation's work has been driven by the goal of helping 60% of all adults in the U.S. attain a post-secondary credential by 2025. For Lumina, reaching this goal is not simply about hitting a numerical target. It requires that we both ensure that these are credentials of value, credentials that have a labor market payoff, and that we close the equity gaps which keep far too many African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans from accessing credentials that are part of a pathway to successful and stable careers. The goal is also focused our strategy at Lumina on adult learners. Of course, we want so-called traditional age students to succeed, but when it comes to meeting the nation's talent needs, we need to bump up against the fact that it takes 18 years to produce an 18-year-old. And uh, as an aside, as the father of two kids who are over 18 and one who's not quite there, I'm not even quite sure that 18 years is enough to produce an 18-year-old. But you get my point. Um, to build a strong economy, we need far more people with skills than the current K-12 pipeline will provide, so it's critical to invest in helping adults, adults with some college and no degree, a group that comprises 26.5 million, or 50% of all adults ages 25 to 64, and adults with a high school, just high school diplomas, which is 44.7 million, or 26% of adults. So that's over 70 million people who we all need in the labor market with more skills and who all will benefit from the opportunity to get credentials of value. Needless to say, the guide is a powerful tool to help reach all these goals. It puts a spotlight on the plurality of institutions committed to helping the vast majority of students earn affordable, in-demand degrees, and is one of the embarrassingly rare resources available to get essential information about these institutions into the hands of students who constitute the largest slice of our post-secondary student demographic. And there's one additional goal we share, um, changing the way policymakers think about what constitutes equality in higher education. In fact, I think this is probably the thing uh, I and many of my colleagues spend the most of our time at Lumina working on. 
And after reading the full issue, I was struck by the distance between the portrait of higher education painted by the elite media and sort of just in circulation, um, uh, and the reality depicted by the rankings and articles in the guide. Now, for this crowd, that's not a particularly deep insight, uh, but it made me think about why this version of what quality higher ed is has such a powerful hold on the imagination of the media and many other elites. So I want to end by quickly offering up some thoughts about three of the most enduring problems with popular notions of what a good college or university is and how we can all challenge them. So first I would argue that we live in a world where the popular definition of a good college or university, uh, what the popular definition is, has a lot to do with the concept of uniformity. College is one kind of place, uh, to use uh, Paul Galastra's words, exclusive, uh, wealthy, and prestigious, that serves one kind of student, affluent white, age 18 to 22. Uh, yes, there are exceptions that break the rule, but often those examples only reinforce the idea that what the, of what the norm is. And it's hard to imagine a better tool to enforce this homogeneity than the US News uh, rankings, as are painfully demonstrated by the countless stories of the hold the rankings have over the choices that leaders of college and universities make. Uh, the Washington Monthly Guide may explain the reality that most institutions are gauged, again to quote Paul, in the task of helping lots of non-wealthy students earn marketable degrees at reasonable prices, uh, 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 produce plenty of scholarship and scholars, and encourage its students to become generous and active citizens. What's more, uh, they are not all coming at the challenge in the same way. Some are trying to be more diverse by including low-income students. Some are creating programs that are more affordable, flexible, and connected to occupational credentials. And some are developing models designed around the needs specific to adult learners. Yes, uh, as the guide is described, it's a different kind of guide, but it's also a guide to the reality that there are lots of different kinds of institution and programs in post-secondary education, a point that we often miss. Second, uh, there's the notion that what makes for quality education is timelessness. The elite model is good in part because it stays the same. Never mind that elite American university, the elite American university is actually a relatively new invention. All those quads designed to mimic Oxford and Cambridge do the trick of making us think these institutions have been around forever, uh, providing an education that has stood the test of time. As we see in Eric Cordelessa's article, the reality is, is that colleges and universities are changing in multiple and profound ways. The demographics of their student body are changing, the use of technology to improve advising, persistence, and completion, uh, curricular shifts to competency best education, and new models of financing. And in the piece by Mary Alice McCarthy and Deborah Bragg, we see how the new degree programs are emerging at community colleges uh, to meet the needs of adult students. The best way to counter the idea that quality implies timelessness is to continue to report on how change is happening and how it makes post-secondary education better for more people and therefore for all of us. And finally, our, pop our popular model of quality in higher education implies that our higher education system is coherent, that it makes sense for everybody. And while it certainly has made sense for some students, the reality is that the model has never made sense for the students who couldn't afford it, uh, couldn't fit it into the realities of their lives, or didn't see it as a match for their interests. We need to get better at understanding that part, that part of what quality should mean uh, is that we have different institutional models offering different types of credentials, serving different student interests. I think the trend we are seeing of the rising importance of post-secondary programs may help on this front. Taking the focus off institutions and putting it onto the specific programs of study could help show that people want different things out of post-secondary education, and a healthy system meets those needs while ensuring quality. However, I think the tendency we see recently of some people to say that BAs don't matter or that the BA is over is just another example um, uh, of a reluctance to acknowledge that we're going to live in a world with seemingly contradictory ideas about what people want out of post-secondary education. So the sense that there's one model of what a quality higher education is, that model, uh, uh, that model is unchanging and is the right model for everybody is going to be with us for the foreseeable future. But it too will change. It will change because its relevance to the world we live in will continue to diminish. Our job is to continue to build and support the students, educators, and institutions that are building new models of higher education and telling their story through the Washington Monthly's College Guide and other platforms. And let me end by saying that on behalf of the Lumina Foundation, we look forward to working with all of you on this important mission. Thank you. the mic to Paul, sorry. Thank you, thank you, Chauncey. Uh, uh, we've, uh, we've been in the same room together but haven't actually said hello. So uh, welcome, it's good to, to, to meet you. Um, thanks for those uh, great framing remarks and kind words. 
Um, I want to get us straight into the discussion, so no remarks from me other than to introduce our panelists. Um, first will be Ann Kim, a contributing editor of the Washington Monthly, a senior fellow at the Progressive Policy Institute, uh, and the author of the forthcoming book by the New Press entitled Abandoned America's Lost Youth and the Crisis of Disconnection. She'll be discussing her terrific story that Chauncey referenced or Kevin referenced on the pre-college racket in the current issue of the Washington Monthly. Second will be George Bridges. He is the sixth president of Evergreen State College in uh, Olympia, Washington, which is the number one master's university on the Washington Monthly rankings. Um, it is also where my son Adam just began his freshman year. So George, take care of the boy. Um, <laughs> Dr. Bridges previously served for 10 years as president of Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington, as well as dean and vice provost of uh, undergraduate education at the University of Washington, and uh, also uh, is a, has served as a, president, a professor of sociology focused on incarceration and criminal justice. Finally, we have uh, Cassie Fibolo, do I have it right? Fibolo? Fibio, Fibio, excuse me. Uh, uh, Cassie is earning a PhD uh, at the, in communications at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, but also is coordinator of the Texas Votes Program, uh, uh, which is part of the Annette Strauss Institute for Civic Life at the university. Her nonpartisan non organization's work increasing student voting uh, is unbelievable. Uh, you can read about it uh, in the uh, story by Daniel uh, Block in the current issue of the Washington Monthly. So with that in mind, I'm gonna invite uh, Ann to start us off. Um, so good morning, everyone. I think you'll be hearing a lot today about the many good things that colleges are or should be doing for their students. Uh, my job this morning is to throw some cold water. You know, part of you know, redefining what a good college is, is to shine a spotlight on the many sort of not so good things that a lot of so-called good colleges are engaging in. And that is what I do in my article for the Washington Monthly, which is titled, if I can get the clicker to work right. I don't know. Technological challenge this morning. It's called the pre-college racket. Um, so what I looked at are the growing number of college summer programs aimed at high school kids. And what I found is that these programs really do exemplify a lot about what's wrong with the current business of higher education. They're not about benefiting students. Rather, they're about making money. They're about profiting from school's brand. They are about exploiting families' anxieties about high-stakes college admissions. And they create false hopes for many students who have really big aspirations. So in, in the good old days, high school summer vacation was just that. You, if you're a high school student, maybe you got a job at McDonald's, you mowed lawns, uh, you spent a lot of time at the pool. But nowadays, it's all about the so-called summer experience. What you do now really matters as far as college admissions. And so that's where the pre-college programs come in. So these programs have actually been around for quite a while, but they've really exploded in number in sort of the past decade or so as college admissions have become really cutthroat. Families are looking for whatever edge they can, and these prestige schools continue to really have this totemic significance for a lot of people. So today, all but one of the top 40 schools in US News and World Report, that one exception is Dartmouth, offers some sort of pre-college summer program for high school students. So these programs have a lot in common. First, they have a similar format. You get one or two weeks or more living on a college campus. You take classes a day. You get fun stuff at night. So for example, if you do the UCLA program, they will take you to Disneyland. They'll take you to the beach. They'll take you to a baseball game. The second thing they have in common is that they are all crazy expensive. So for instance, a two-week program at Harvard last summer will set you back about $4,600. Four weeks at Brown is about $7,000, and that's not including the plane fare to get there and pocket money. And so the third thing that these programs have in common is how they're marketed, either implicitly or explicitly as a way to get a leg up on admissions. This is a problem, which I'll talk about. So 
for example, this keeps coming back to this screen. I don't know why. Um, here are some screenshots from the websites for summer programs at uh, Johns Hopkins, Columbia, and Stanford. As you can see, it's pretty explicit. And uh, implicitly, if we ever see it, these programs hint at some sort of you know, selectivity. They often have admissions processes that look an awful lot like the real thing. You know, at Harvard, for example, they ask you for the $75 non-refundable application fee. You have to turn in a counselor report. You need transcripts. Stanford, same thing, application fee, transcripts, up to four recommendations, work samples. So now here's the bad part. These programs don't actually deliver the kinds of benefits that families think that they're getting. You know, schools will even tell you that these programs don't matter for admissions if you ask them. What these programs are is it's about making money, including from kids who cannot afford it. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. So first of all, though, why don't these programs help? I talked to about a half a dozen admissions uh, experts for my story, and uh, here's what they said, eventually. Um, these programs are essentially passive experiences. You know, you're not going to be able to tell a lot about a kid just by the fact that they go there. And they're not selective. Despite these elaborate admissions processes that make you want to think that's the case, they really will take anyone who can pay. Um, just for an instance, 3,000 kids go to Stanford summer programs every year. That's nearly double the number of undergraduate freshmen that the college admits. These programs are also typically run by an extension program or even by an outside vendor. So they're not even close to the real thing. But what is real is the money. These things are money-making machines. And the real reason these programs don't matter is that admissions officers actually do know that. So for as one example, you know, I write in my article that in 2015, Brown University made about $6 million from its summer programs, according to an article in campus newspaper. And about 70% of that was pure profit. This would all be fine, maybe, if schools were simply going after the rich kids, but, that, but they're not. They're also targeting families who cannot afford it, but who think that they are making an investment in their children's future. So for instance, a lot of schools offer up fundraising guides complete with sample letters so that students can hit up their friends and family for donations. Here's a, a sample letter from Brown, as a matter of fact. You can see it's a form letter that you can kind of fill in. The other thing that these schools do is actually encourage kids to run GoFundMe campaigns. So if you search pre-college on the GoFundMe website, you will find more than 4,300 appeals from students. And if you read these appeals, they will really tear your heart out. Kids just get unbelievably excited about having gotten in to one of these programs. And they really believe that going to one of these programs is going to make a difference for them. Just as one example, I will conclude with the story of Kirsten, whom I write about in my piece. Her family tried to raise about $5,500 for one of Stanford's pre-college summer programs. Turned out that program is actually run by a private company called Envision, so it's not really Stanford at all. Her family ended up in debt to pay for this experience, and as far as we can tell, Kirsten did not later get into Stanford. She went to a local school. I don't doubt that there are many, many, many Kirstens out there every summer, and so long as these kinds of programs are allowed to continue, I don't doubt there's going to be a lot more. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ann. Um, that was discouraging. <laughs> I'm going to bring some uh, some good news to all of you. I'm very pleased to be here. I want to thank uh, certainly New America, Washington Monthly, and Lumina for uh, creating this opportunity for me not only to brag about Evergreen, but also to talk about uh, the future of higher education as we see it and um, the way in which higher education is changing, even at schools that um, may not think they need to change. <clears throat> uh, and it's a privilege to come here from Washington State. Uh, we refer to our 
position in the Northwest as the real Washington, and this, this place as the surreal Washington. <laughs> but I think we all know that Washington State has always been a uh, home for innovators and new thinkers, whether it's a place where Microsoft, Starbucks, Amazon, and uh, certainly Costco have reimagined uh, technology, coffee, commerce, and have had a profound impact not only on our region of the country, but certainly, certainly the nation. It's also a place where 50 years ago, uh, our state leaders at the time imagined a new form of higher education. And against the traditional uh, backdrop, the backdrop of a traditional flagship institution like the University of Washington and a great land grant institution like Washington State, <clears throat> they sought something different. Um, they sought a school that would be free of many of the obstacles and barriers that educators at the time believe impeded learning, that, um, that impeded direct engagement with the complexity of real world problems, and that had instruction that marries academic coursework with rich learning experiences completely outside of the classroom. So Evergreen's mission <clears throat> as a small liberal arts college, public liberal arts college on the shores of Puget Sound it's always focused on learning that mimics <clears throat> and embraces uh, real life complexity. We layer academic disciplines on one another in programs of study focused on some of the most challenging uh, social and global problems. We have no academic departments. We have no academic majors. And as some of you know, the undergraduate experience is comprised of courses taught by teams of faculty from different disciplines. So at this moment, um, well, not quite at this moment. Students are still sleeping at this moment. Um, <clears throat> they are studying systems of sustainable agriculture taught by a mathematician and a botanist. Another group is studying poverty in America with a poet and a sociologist looking at the written and spoken words of those in poverty to assess and feel the impact of the gross economic inequality that pervades our country. And Another group is a group of native and non-native students studying indigenous arts in education, actually doing um, the kind of carving and, uh, and painting and um, art creation that uh, those in the Salish Sea, the area of the Northwest, do uh, as part of our relations with the many local tribes in and around the Northwest. So we also understand that a deep part of learning that occurs and must occur really in higher education, requires students to leave classrooms and to enter into relationships with businesses, um, government agencies, and nonprofit organizations and for credit experiences. It's convenient, very helpful to us that we are in the state capitol. So their experiences, at least our students' experiences, enable them to work in, the, work in and for the state legislature, to assist local schools, and to work in conservation organizations planning for climate change. So all of our students have these as options and uh, they can work with faculty to create their own paths of study. And paths of study is a key theme through all of our work. Um, among many of the societal issues that uh, is pressing our country, that is of resonant to our students and to me professionally, <clears throat> um, is helping currently and formerly incarcerated individuals connect fully with society and increase the chance of contributing to the greater good um, in our community. And so Evergreen has a series of programs, uh, not just one, that works very closely on these issues that really is engaging, enge engages and inspires our students to think more broadly about the role of higher education in contributing to the larger society. <clears throat> um, one of them um, uh, brings federally funded science research into uh, a local prison, enabling and empowering the residents, the inmates, the prisoners there to participate fully and completely as research assistants. Another um, brings <clears throat> our students to youth correctional facilities, enabling them to mentor and work side by side with young men and women who are incarcerated. We also have a fairly large number of individuals, prisoners who are former prisoners, justice involved individuals who are currently fully uh, enrolled in Evergreen's classes, and they bring a depth and richness to uh, our academic experience that really isn't met by any other group. And I'll end with a story <clears throat> that refers to uh, a, a seminar I taught last fall that was on the crisis of mass, mass incarceration in the United States. And imagine this, 
15 students, two of which were formerly incarcerated, a local police officer, um, four, uh, another group was four um, uh, single, single, uh, single parents who were returning to education, three were uh, military veterans, and another four or five were um, students who had just uh, graduated from high school and were engaging in college for the first time. The conversations were, were vibrant and respectful, and the positions that were represented were vastly different. And I guess my measure of the success of the class was when at the very end of the experience, the quarter, the term, um, one of the students <clears throat> who brought at the beginning of the class the most radical left approach to understanding our justice system came up to me and said, thank you for leading the seminar. You have totally confused me. And I knew I'd been successful. We had been successful because it was a, a cross-fertilization of ideas that challenged his preconceptions of the work. So when I think about what makes a good college, I think of four attributes. First, it has to empower students, to be focused on them and be student-centered. This means being student-ready, which many colleges aren't. Second, there must be academic preparation that readies students for the complexity of the real world challenges that we as a society are facing, and that they need to learn from disciplines vastly different from one another and to be able to weave them together simultaneously. Third, a commitment to serving the greater good, the greater public good. We need to not only welcome and support students from underrepresented populations, but to also appreciate and take advantage of the assets they bring to our classes, to our learning, to everyone's learning. And finally, a learning that links theory to practice, day in and day out, such that it isn't purely academic, but that it links to real world experiences that enables our students to change. These are attributes that I think every college must have if it thinks of itself as a good college, but serving the greater public good is much more than simply providing an education to those who can afford it. Thank you. So hi everyone, my name is Cassie Fibio. I am the program coordinator for Texas Votes, which is a nonpartisan student organization at the University of Texas at Austin that um, registers and turns out students to vote on our university. We're sponsored by the Annette Strauss Institute for Civic Life, which is hosted within the Moody College of Communications at UT, which is a really unique place where a civic engagement institute to be housed. Um, our story is a little different than most successful voter engagement programs on college campuses. At UT, I am the administrator who oversees voter engagement. Um, I'm a 20 hour a week graduate student, right? So like really, if you wanna put that into perspective, most teaching assistants and I are on the same playing field, but I oversee all voter engagement at our university, um, which is a really fun challenge for me. As a first gen college student, being scrappy is how I've gotten by for a long time. So uh, in my fifth year as a PhD student, it's like really come in handy. My students are amazing. So when I started five years ago, I had just one returning student. Uh, and about two weeks into my tenure, I was contacted by the Foundation for Civic Leadership and said that they had a small grant for us um, in order to do our work, which came at a great time because I was also hearing that maybe I should just kill the student organization and do other work for the rest of my time at UT. Um, since that moment of receiving that grant and learning how to first start creating a campus plan, we have been planning day in and day night and then producing the results at our university. Um, first, the first thing that we did was create a coalition of student organizations who do and don't do any kind of political engagement. So um, an acapella group, we had our Indian dance pop group come out and perform at one of our events recently. And then they pushed out the news that everyone needed to be registered to vote. And we think that this really diverse group of students uh, who are saying that voting is so important on our campus has been one of the huge reasons why we are successful at what we do. Um, additionally, at that time, we just have been growing as a student organization. So uh, I'll get to our numbers in just a second. But what we have found is that 
2016, we had about a 15% increase in turnout. 2018 from 2014, we had over a 35% increase in turnout. So, yes, it's awesome. <laughs> and it's all student driven. Um, and I think that is powerful. People want to institutionalize civic engagement. And on campuses where that works, that is an important goal. But we can't ignore the campuses where that isn't happening and isn't accepted as the route. So at UT, we have some friends who are national partners. Um, one of our first friends is the Institute for Democracy and Higher Education at Tufts University, uh, led by Nancy Thomas. They are the ones who put together the reports for us to see how we're doing. These reports go beyond just our voter turnout and voter registration rates. They tell us how our students are turning out to vote by like their area of study. That's how we learned that our STEM students are turning out about at about 10% lower rates than the rest of campus, right? What does that mean? That means that in our coalition building, we have to target our STEM student organizations more. Our Student Engineering Council is now one of our most powerful partners on campus. It also means that we can take this data and inform different, um, like we found out that men are turning out at 10% lower rates than women. Then we start talking to our fraternities. How do we help those students turn out to vote? And also, you know, give a little clap for our women who are doing a great job. <laughs> um, and using that data informs how we move forward. Um, then we work with friends like the Campus Vote Project, NASPA, um, as well as On Campus Democracy Challenge to create a really inclusive and very in-depth voting guide. But when we're making this voting guide, we need to think of a few things. And that really comes to what are the state laws in the state of Texas? Um, there are a lot of laws about voting and registering to vote in Texas that people in other states will never come across. So we have to become the experts because it's important that we are, in fact, teaching our students how to vote and making it seem easy. If you think that voting is hard, if your peers think that voting is hard, you are not going to turn out to vote. The research supports that. So what we have to do as the students who are supporting this work is make it easy. We are the ones who go through the hour-long training every other year in order to register students to vote just for our county. We are the ones who help find polling locations for our students. We are the ones who make the uh, impossible to read ballot language easier for our students to read. I joke, I'm getting a political communications PhD and I don't know what the ballot initiatives actually mean. And so it's important to make it easy. We acknowledge that it's hard and for our politically savvy students, we can talk about that. But the reality is if you want your students to turn out to vote, you have to make it seem easy even if it's not always that easy. Um, Recently, we have been getting recognition, and it's been very exciting. So this picture is with our state senator, who is fantastic and supports student voting, um, Kirk Watson. And he actually was giving our student organization um, a joint resolution from him and our state representative, uh, recognizing the work that we do on a night that we were staying out until midnight to register students to vote up until the registration deadline for this November election. And so I, I think that like that's a really great encapsulation of everything that we've done as a student organization and that we've done to create an environment of voter engagement across our entire campus because it's not just about your students who are government students or history students or political communication students. We want all students, no matter what they study or what they believe, to turn out to vote and we are seeing it again in these really amazing numbers. So um, thank you. Uh, Thank you all for your uh, remarks. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions, a sort of moderator's prerogative, and then open it up to the audience. Um, one of the uh, uh, interesting th things that cuts across all three of your uh, remarks is uh, the difference between an institution that is really focused on engaging the students as you find them and an institution exploiting the students as you can, right? Um, this, this is kind of a, just a theme that you see in higher education. And so I want to I wanna ask um, each of you, starting uh, Anne with you, um, uh, how, how do you fight against the tendency of universities? So in the, in the case of these, of these um, 
of these college, uh, pre-college programs, there's a huge market for this. People are, people think that this is doing them some good, and I imagine some have that experience, right? And and but on the whole, um, these can be very damaging. How how do you get the word out? How do you get across uh, to folks that this is not a good program? That's a big question. Um, college admissions counselors are part of the question, part of the, part of the solution, of course. But I think some of it has got to be how these programs are marketed. And there needs to be, potentially be a little bit of intervention here. Because any other product would be regulated in some way about truth in advertising. It would be extremely helpful, I think, if all of these schools were required to say, in very large print, very high up, you know, these programs don't matter for admissions. We don't look at these programs if you go to them. Or these programs are not run by the university. Or but these by programs are not Acme run by the university. Yeah. Right. So if you go to this, you know, the pre Stanford pre college site that Kristen Kirsten went to, you'll see in very tiny print by Envision, the vendor that's running this, this program is not affiliated with Stanford Law in any way. Mm -hmm. But you need to dig through like three different web pages to get there, and the print is in six point type. So there may need to be a little bit of external pressure on these schools to regulate how they market these programs. Yeah, maybe the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau or something like that. Or the yeah. FTC, right. Um, Cassie, in, your, in the story that, that Daniel Block did about you, um, uh, it, it makes clear that the Texas legislature has made it particularly difficult to um, do what you do, to register students to, and to get them actually to the polls. Um, and, and yet, the harder they work, the more successful you guys seem to be. So explain that to me. Uh, what, what, g give me some examples yeah. of, of what the legislature has done that make get it, students getting to the polls more difficult. So there are certainly rules in place that are harder for college students. I have to be very diplomatic, because everything we do is incredibly nonpartisan. Um, so for example, in order to register someone to vote, you must become a volunteer deputy registrar. That's an hour-long training that you have to do on, at the end of every even-numbered year. Um, and so it's a thing. It's only good for the county that you're in. Luckily, most of our students decide to vote on campus, which makes my life a lot easier. Um, and so we learn that role. We're in a very friendly county. So we are very good friends with our county officials. I work incredibly closely. Um, I was texting our county official yesterday about something, and so what we've done is we bring those trainings to the students. I'm now a volunteer trainer outside of all of my other obligations, and we do those trainings with students so that uh, individual student organizations can then do these uh, register students themselves. And I think that's a really good example of, okay, we're making it happen. Luckily, students want to do this. I have four pending um, requests right now for trainings, which is great. I'm like, yes, we're understanding it. And we do trainings with like communications council, with our residents' life. And so finding the people who want to do those things and making it easier, I think, is a, a really good example of how we have worked around some of the laws of the state in order to be successful in that manner. Um, because most states now have online voter registration, and we just don't. So. Well, you know, I, I'll, I'll <laughs> say one more thing that, that um, in Texas, it's uh, legal, it's Ill, you cannot use your student ID nope. <laughs> as, as a form of ID for voting, but you can use your hunting license. Uh, your gun license. Gun license, gun license. yes. Right. Yeah. George, um. <laughs> George um, you said that Evergreen College, Evergreen State College has been around for 50 years and it's got this remarkable model for educating that sounds to my ears like exactly what all the best studies of college learning say we should be doing in the classroom. And it sounds very hot and innovative, and it's 50 years old. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the model has taken some time to get, it, get the word out. Um, why, has, why aren't more universities doing? I, I, I heard recently when I gave a some remarks at a place about uh, Evergreen and my son going there. A bunch of people who really know higher education said Evergreen has the best um, student uh, evaluation system or among the best in the country. They don't have grades. Instead, the professors write 
evaluative essays of the students, right? Yes. And um, here are your strengths, here are your weaknesses, and if you didn't do all the work up to par, you lose some credit, and you have a chance to make it up, but it's like tougher than grades, and yet it's not grades. Absolutely. It is a model that uh, I think is very impressive, and having taught at six different kinds of universities and colleges over the course of my career, this is by far the superior model, but it's intensely laborsome. Having uh, taught this seminar, I realized at the end of the seminar, for my, this is my first time teaching at Evergreen, I'd write narrative evaluations of each student. I couldn't just give them a grade. And I thought, this is going to take time. It takes energy. So first, it's labor intensive. Second, most colleges and universities can't do what we do because of the impediments, the structures of the institutions themselves. Academic departments have requirements and have faculty responsibilities to teach this course every other year, every other term. And try putting a sociology department together with a biology department <clears throat> to teach the impact of climate change. It doesn't work. It's too expensive. And, and it's very hard to cross-fertilize departments when there are rigid departmental structures. So part of the challenge, I think, for most schools in doing this kind of work, where you're literally bringing faculty together to argue and weave together disciplines, is institutions, they simply don't have the resources or the structures in place to do it. Evergreen was designed that way and built that way and has operated that way for 50 years. That stated, we are changing. We are changing in ways to respond to the new wave of students, the new generation of students. And being student ready, as opposed to the expectation that all students are college ready, is a daunting cultural shift, particularly for a faculty, because they tend to teach, many tend to teach, the way they were taught. But it's a different generation of students with different expectations, with different backgrounds and life experiences. And so part of becoming a student ready college, to accept the students you have, welcome them, and appreciate their assets, means that you must understand the impact of their backgrounds, their learning experiences, and what their needs and expectations are of you. So uh, it, it's a fascinating model, but the model must shift as society is shifting. And we are doing that, but it is <clears throat> a steady commitment to focus more and more on students, their needs, whoever they are, that they are ours. And our job is to ensure that they're successful as best we can. I think that's about as pithy an explanation or a, a, a stab at what this gathering is about, which is sort of redefining what good is. We've really kind of wrestled with how to, wh where we think the conversation is going. And the, this idea that you, I, I forget how you put it, you, you, the, the college needs to be student ready, not the students need to be college ready. Um, I think that, that really sums it up because um, you know, the, the expectations in this economy, the, the demands of this economy are that more or less everyone who graduates high school needs to have some kind of post-secondary credential to have a shot at, the, at a middle class life. And it's no longer possible. And I think what's changing is the demand of individuals, of students, of their parents that, hey, my kid needs a college education, and I don't want to hear you say, well, he just didn't make it or she didn't make it. I want you to find the roadblocks and, and make sure this student has every opportunity to, to uh, achieve it. I think uh, Dwayne, Ma uh, uh, Dwayne um, uh, Matthews of Lumina uh, said it best, uh, everything about that, how does he put it? Everything about college should be easy except the learning. Learning's hard, but everything else should be easy. Um, and um, Cassie, that's what you've been trying to do uh, on the civic part of this. And again, part of the definition of good college to me and to the magazine and to New America is not just you know, work ready, but civil ready. Ability to go out and participate in the democracy as we are expected to do. So. Um, I think at this point we ought to um, open it up to you folks in the audience. Um, we would love to have your questions. And uh, please uh, wait for the microphone. Uh, tell us your name and your affiliation. Um, the lovely lady right there. 
Hi, Paul. Um, I'm Shannon Brownlee. I'm a former New America Fellow. I'm now the Senior Vice President of the Lown Institute, which is a small um, healthcare think tank. And I have a question for Dr. Bridges. Um, but first, go gooey ducks. I'm a banana slug. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sister college. Yes. Um, no grades. Uh, my question is, what impact do you think these kinds of rankings have on the way college presidents and administrations um, think about their own institutions? Do they have a real impact um, on, on how colleges behave, how they, how they may change their um, admission standards, or they may change practices? Do they have a real impact? And I'd like you to you know, tell me what that impact might be in your conversations with other presidents and your ex experience as a president of other universities. Well, big question. <clears throat> they do have an impact. Uh, I'm not sure I can speak for all college presidents. I'm pretty sure I can't. Um, nevertheless, we do consider them uh, as, uh, uh, if nothing else, a way of describing who we are. But uh, rankings, one lives with the rank di and dies by the rankings. and so. Most of my uh, colleagues, uh, college presidents, we read them, we wonder about them, and uh, we try not to rely on them. I don't think they change, <clears throat> for mo in most cases, how we do the work of leading an institution. I pray that they don't. Um, but uh, at the same time, I would like them to reflect the rankings, to reflect what we actually do and what our students experience. That's what's most important. And it's a bit of a tragedy that, as, as Paul and, uh, pointed out, uh, and Anne's, Anne's work certainly shows, uh, that many of the rankings reflect nothing more than the wealth uh, of an institution, uh, not what the student experience is like or not what the students become after they leave. And that's the tragedy of these rankings. And so I'm very wary of them. Um, we're delighted, of course, with the way Washington Monthly <clears throat> evaluate students, not because we did well, but because it makes sense, given our work as a public institution with a commitment to serving the greater public good. I'm not sure I've answered your question, but. Can I ask Paul, do you think the rankings change the way universities and colleges think about their students? I do. Um, many a state government builds into their strategic plan right, for their university systems, um, reward systems and efforts to go higher on the US news rankings. Mm. Um, in one case, a college president got a bonus uh, if that president rose on the US news college rank, more than one occasion. So um, our reporting suggests that they, that they very much do. Um, I would like to think that they don't, and I'm, you know, Evergreen, you know, is a, uh, I think a, uh, I don't want to say outlier, but it's a crusty, you know, refusenik when it comes to bowing down to a lot of the nonsense that um, guides uh, these things. And I think, I think it's changing. I think that the, you know, other rankings have come on board, not just ours. Um, there's a lot of pressure from parents and uh, students against the insane costs of universities. Um, there is a, a, a lot of um, pressure from politicians who are having to foot the bill. And um, uh, so I, I think there's an opening now for a more democratic vision of what universities should be. Um, and I think one of the fun things about doing the Washington Monthly rankings with Kevin is uh, we hear back from a lot of universities who don't normally get the spotlight shine shown on them, saying, oh, not only was this a great morale booster, but it helped with our board of trustees. It helped with the legislature. It helps us make the case for doing the right thing, which is serving the students we have, not finding us a better sort of student. Um, so yeah, I do think they matter um, a lot. Um, this gentleman over here, please. He's got my Jim Sang, um, question for uh, Ms. Kim. Um, how do the programs you talk about fit in with things like uh, RSI at MIT and NSF used to run summer programs for students 
And I noticed, for example, that uh, Tsing Hua and, and Tu Dan have both copied the RSI and IIT also. Mm -hmm. So they seem to be very popular around the world. Are they popular here? Um, so you're talking about programs that are genuinely selective and um, yes, often and free. RSI, RSI, yes. MIT, yes. 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 Right. NSF, you, 50 years ago, when I was young, they actually sent me the uh -huh. Carnegie Mellon for a summer. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it's interesting because MIT actually tries to distinguish these programs that they offer that are highly competitive, actually, and free for the students who get in mm -hmm. um, with other programs out there. In fact, if you go on their website, it actually says many student, many summer programs will accept people who can pay. Our programs are different because, and they do target a very particular population, like minority, minority students who are high achieving. So part of the challenge here is that it's harder for these programs that are genuinely good to rise above the crowd in the sea of other programs that are maybe not as good. But does that say something about the parents more than the program? It says something about the market. It says something about the market for these programs, I think. And I think it says something about the deliberate confusion caused by elite schools that are offering these programs, hoping that they'll be mistaken for an RSI or some of these other programs that are out there. Do these parents know about, for example, things like RSI? Some parents, a lot of them don't. You know, a lot of them don't. Um, other questions? Yes. Hi, great panel. I'm Catherine Fish. I am with the All in Campus Democracy Challenge, and we're a nonpartisan nonprofit that supports about 500 colleges with increasing their student voting and democratic engagement work. Cassie um, is a champion, and we work closely with her at University of Texas. Um, my question is for Dr. Bridges and Cassie. I'm interested in hearing kind of what you think college presidents should be doing to increase student voting and kind of support their staff and students in becoming active citizens. And Cassie, from you, I'm interested in hearing about what you kind of wish your president was doing or has been doing to support your efforts. Thanks. Well, our schools are vastly different. We have 3,000 students. Texas has 3 million students. <laughs> 50,000. <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, the role of the college president at a small college is very different than that at a major research university. I engage with students all the time. That is one of the joys of my job. And so we talk about these issues. That stated, every college president I talk to is, if not mortified, very wary of what will happen in 2020 on our campuses across the country. Because as we know, campuses can be the uh, the beginning point of, 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 of social unrest and change and, and protest activity. Voting, I, I really applaud Cassie's work and your work for engaging students in a political process. And um, in thinking about going back to our campus um, tonight, uh, this is something that I want us to do more of on our campus. And I can certainly be a voice and uh, inspiration for that work. Uh, uh, Evergreen students have minds of their own. and. Um, and so I may make um, inspiring speeches, and they, they will do something else. So it's always a challenge to build relationships in ways that ensures they understand that we, as an institution, are supportive of engagement, and that they find the ways to engage that are most constructive. Um, at UT, as I was saying, I, I am the pinnacle of administrative support at our university for voter engagement, and I think that's like the first issue, right? Um, a graduate student who hopefully isn't there for any longer than the end of this year, um, <laughs> the joys of PhD life, um, shouldn't be the one carrying that institutional memory forward. Um, and I think that's a huge issue. I'm like sitting here thinking about writing a document for the person who replaces me, and I'm like, oh, I mean, that's a lot, and I go above and beyond what, is, what I would ever want to ask a graduate student to do in terms of time, money, resources. Um, and so I think the first step is finding a full-time person to be doing this work. And I think secondarily, something as simple as a supportive email that went out to all students saying, today is the last day to register to vote for this upcoming November election. The most we received in 2016, or no, 2018, was an email saying that today is the election, voting is probably a good thing. I mean, that's not exactly what it said, but that was the, the feeling about it. And then, um, please don't respond violently if things don't go your way. That was kind of the gist of the email that went out to our campus. And I was just like, I was devastated, right? I'm like, I'm doing all of this really difficult work. Um, our student government president sent a campus-wide email that I don't think he was allowed to be able to do. Um, saying voting is good, please go vote. 
Um, but, uh, and so something as simple as that, to know that like your president is even on your side would be fantastic, but I also have to recognize the fact that we are a state school, our Board of Regents is appointed by our governor, look into that if you want to, and, um, and so I, I think that I personally wouldn't, don't feel like I would ask a lot because I know the situation that, the per, that our president is in, but I would ask that we have someone who can maintain institutional memory for what we're doing on campus and like a supportive email would just make me so happy. <laughs> I'll write it for you. I would be so um, happy. <laughs> this gentleman right here. Thank you all so much. Mike Bartlett, National Governors Association. I'm going to ask a very self-serving question. Um, and this is really for the entire panel and the moderator, too. What would your all's advice be to governors who are grappling with this issue and really trying to push their institutions to be student-centered and focused on success and long-term outcomes? Uh, what would your advice to them be? Well, I can speak to what I told our governor um, uh, as we signed the bill uh, last spring. I mean, what we need to do is to ensure that students, whatever their backgrounds, have wraparound supports that enable them to be successful, which means an investment in new forms of student services and, key, key and here, uh, training for faculty in new ways of teaching, new ways of learning, um, development knowledge about the brain science and how people learn and what memory spans are and how does that change the classroom experience? So we've invested, thanks to um, some of the progressive views of, of our governor, uh, uh, many of the ways in which we think about students, support them uh, in, in their very first year, and subsequently, and then our faculty, enabling them to rethink how they teach, how they learn, and uh, what new skills they need. Um, I think in the state of Texas when it comes to things like voting, which is where my expertise is, um, I, and I think that the statement can go across all expertises, is actually take a chance to listen to students from like many of the universities within your state. Mm -hmm. Texas is huge, right? And we have many universities and many of them are amazing. Listen to them and what they want. We had students writing bills about getting new polling locations on college campuses that never got to see the light of day, which is like remarkable that they're literally writing bills. Um, and then I think secondarily from my really like voting centric perspective, like let's do things to help students vote. California just passed legislation on student voting that is amazing. I wish we could consider that in the state of Texas. My advice to governors would hinge on something that was actually covered in last year's um, college guide on the importance of counseling. Uh, the article that I wrote kind of pinpointed to me just how important marketing is by these so-called good colleges. And there is no counter to that. And so many places are disinvesting in college counseling to high school level. There needs to be a countervailing force against the US news rankings, mm -hmm. the marketing that all these colleges are pushing on students, um, so, that colleges, so that students really know what is the right fit for them and have a full array of information available. And really, only counselors can provide that. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say the governors, the great thing about higher education and higher education reform is that it's pre-ideological, right? We don't really know what a Republican or a Democratic reform agenda is, like at least voters don't, right? There's some differences. And if you look around the country, um, yeah, Jay Inslee is a great innovator, but so is Mitch Daniels in Indiana, a Republican. So is, uh, Governor, uh, is it Hassan in, in, in Tennessee, who did the, the first big free community college program. So, you know, this is a, a really an area where ideology and politics doesn't have to come into it. What has to come into it is a recognition that um, the old ways of, th that the old ways of doing things, of focusing all of your effort and money on your flagship university that has the football team and that all the lawyers that you know, you know, in the big firms went to, um, that is not how you provide the education that you need for your citizens going forward. And that no, no, no organization, right, that makes money in the private sector says to itself, you know, let's just ignore two-thirds of the possible customers here. And if they can't find their way you know, let's put a, 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 a hazardous obstacle course between us and the cash register, you know, between the customer and the cash register. Nobody does that, only higher education. So it's really a different mindset that says every American 
not, shouldn't just have a chance to go to college, but it should have a, a very decent path to getting a degree. And that is, it's just a different mindset and a different sense of, 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 of that. Um, we had a lady over here that had a question, and I wanted to get to you. Um, we've got about a minute. So if you could ask your question quickly, and we're going to get it in before, uh, before lunch. Bloom, the executive director of the President's Alliance on Higher Education and Immigration, and thank you for being a member. Uh, my question is, building on this conversation, is that to be student ready, you talked about the need for wraparound student support, and Cassie talked about the need for a full-time person, and this gets into funding, both for public colleges and private colleges, as well as to be fully engaged and student ready is also to recognize the need for engagement, which can lead college leaders into a murky area between trying to be nonpartisan and open to every, everyone, and at the same time being clear about the values and importance connected to the educational mission. How do you navigate that? How do you navigate the financial sustainability, the, the political issues, the confusion about what it means to be nonpartisan and engaged? I do not have a one minute answer for that. <laughs> And it's a great question, and it's a question um, all of those in public institutions struggle with. It's a struggle. I, I was originally going to write my dissertation on literally what does nonpartisanship mean. Just to like put into perspective, my question is still kind of related to it. And, and I think that nonpartisanship, frankly, looks different state to state, right? Um, what I'm allowed to do in Texas, um, it is partisan to go on the record saying whether or not you support online voter registration, right? You have to know your state to be good at being nonpartisan. And sometimes it may seem detrimental, but I want access to every classroom I can get in to register those students to vote. So we don't do advocacy for that reason. We advocate for anything that benefits students. Bottom line, I can, I can, I can do that. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it, it's dark water. So uh, I don't want to be the person that stands between you and lunch. This is the program. There's uh, food in the back. Um, please help yourselves. We're going to take about 15, 20 minutes. So probably you're going to want to bring your food back uh, to your chairs. And then we're going to get going with the second panel at, uh, in about, uh, about 20 minutes, right? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, a round of applause for the panel, please. Policy Program of New America. Um, she's a veteran of both the U.S. Departments of Education and Labor. I don't know anyone who's done that. And so she brings a particular knowledge of both the higher ed part of it and the vocational and skills part of this important issue. And she is the co-author with uh, her colleague Deborah Bragg of a terrific story called Escaping the Transfer Trap in the latest issue of the Washington Monthly. She's going to start us off. Mary Owls. Thank you, Paul, and thanks to everyone for, for coming today. And again, thanks to the Washington Monthly for another great edition of the College Guide. So I am actually going to now introduce someone else. But yes, as Paul said, we are going to be moving in a little bit to um, a, a, a series of discussions about how to some of our higher education's policies and programs that were designed to help students get through college and were designed to, to help uh, um, states and, and the government build good colleges are very much out of whack with where our, how our economy and society have developed over the last several decades and that we need to do, there are some great opportunities to fix those policies and programs, but, but we need to hear about what those would look like. So we're going to start today by hearing from Grace Gadai, who is the editor at the, uh, who is an editor at the Washington Monthly and wrote an excellent piece about the federal work study program. Federal work study is one of our signature student aid programs. It's also sort of a darling of politicians. Nobody's against federal work study. But boy, is that program sort of under leveraged and out of whack with the, the needs of students and institutions today. So Grace, do you want to kick us off? Thanks for the introduction. Um, so earlier this year, there was a controversy when it came to light that Harvard was using federal work study money to pay students to clean dorms. In other words, they were getting a federal subsidy to pay low-income students to clean the toilets and rooms of other students. Um, and for the students doing the cleaning, their job counted as part of their financial aid package. 
And the controversy pointed out some major flaws with the federal work study program. The first is that a disproportionate share of the money goes to schools like Harvard, private four-year institutions with big endowments that tend to educate wealthier students. And far less of it makes it into the hands of students at public four-year universities and community colleges. And the second flaw is the types of jobs that are available for work-study students. Um, at a time when students are struggling to make the leap from finishing college to a great first job, work-study is not really being leveraged to help them with that. Instead, it makes available kind of a smattering of on-campus jobs, which may or very well may not relate to their interests or career goals in any way. Um, when Workstay was created in the 1960s as part of LBJ's War on Poverty, the notion of working your way through college if you got work study was actually pretty feasible. Um, and by the 70s, the average work study award just about coverage, covered average college tuition. But since then, as we know, college tuition has skyrocketed dramatically, and the college going population has grown more diverse and less affluent. And now many more middle and low income students are going to college, but are often taking on one or two or more jobs to cover costs. And at the same time, work study awards have shrunk because Congress has not increased the budget to keep pace with inflation. So students these days get an average award of about $1,500. And as Mary Alice alluded to, kind of the distribution of funds is really whacked out. Um, because more than half of it goes to these schools that got in right at the beginning of the program and have continued to be kind of grandfathered in on an ongoing basis. Most of those schools are elite private schools, and they don't even enroll that many low-income students. So that's how you could get, say, an upper-middle-class student at NYU, a private school, getting work-study, while a student at a nearby public school, a CUNY, might not. Um, but while work study will probably never go back to actually covering tuition, research shows that there are two big reasons we should want to expand the program. The first is that students who are given work study are more likely to graduate. And one reason for that is for students who are going to have to work either way, work study gives them access to a job um, in, in, in place of a job off campus that might be less predictable less flexible, um, maybe like being a server at a restaurant, which could be harder to kind of keep pace with coursework. Um, but whatever the reason, the striking thing is that work study has a larger impact on graduation rates than some of its mu much larger financial aid programs like Pell Grants. The other place where work study's potential is being overlooked is helping students get ready to start high quality jobs when they graduate. Um, because while students from wealthier backgrounds are able to spend their summers doing unpaid internships in expensive cities and building out their resumes and making connections, other college students aren't able to do that. Um, and if work study is modified to emphasize helping students find jobs in their field of interest, either on campus or off, that could really open doors. And if it were possible for students to use their work study money more flexibly, um, say for periods of full-time employment or over the summer, that could also really help them. Perhaps the best model for this program would be to model it after the co-op system like uh, they have at Northeastern University. There, many students do six month stints of full-time employment while they're undergrads. Um, and they get jobs kind of related to their career interests. And according to the school, half of Northeastern students who do co-ops get jobs from their co job offers from their co-op employers. Um, and more than 90% of students have a job or are enrolled in grad school a year after they graduate. But to unleash the potential of work study, college, uh, Congress needs to vastly increase the program's budget. Right now, the total is only about a billion dollars, which is a tiny fraction of federal spending on higher education. And as a result, many of the students who would benefit from the program don't have access to it. And this clear bipartisan support for the program, um, and many of the reforms I've suggested, including from the Trump administration, which makes it somewhat of a unicorn in DC. So it's not as sexy as something like universal free college, but it's got something from, for everyone to like. Um, it encourages work, it prepares students for jobs, 
um, and it helps them actually graduate. Thank you. And now I just want to share a few thoughts on, on the article that Paul mentioned that um, I wrote with uh, Dr. Deborah Bragg, who is here in the audience, on called Escaping the Transfer Gap. Um, and this is a piece about uh, uh, some community colleges in Washington that actually deliver bachelor's degrees. Okay, They deliver bachelor's degrees in fields like healthcare and education and business, and critically in the Seattle area, in IT. Right. So while the piece is about some specific schools and programs and students, some of whom you're going to meet here in just a minute, our goal with the piece was to really highlight how as a country we're really under leveraging our community colleges as a system and set of institutions that can help get more Americans to that finish line of a bachelor's degree. Um, so I always, I always love talking about this concept of you know, community colleges delivering bachelor's degree, because a lot of times when you, when you mention it to people, you get this sort of instinctive, almost knee-jerk reaction of like, oh, no, they can't do that. They don't, they don't do bachelor's degrees. And it's true, right? Our community colleges, we also call them two-year institutions, um, deliver associate degrees, and they also deliver a lot of other stuff, certificates and many other things. But the one thing that we sort of understand that they don't do is deliver uh, a bachelor's degree. That's what our four-year institutions do. They don't deliver them very often in four years, but, but there's this sort of clear demarcation. So why is that? Why, why, don't, why do we have that demarcation and what purpose is it serving? And, um, and I think that that's a really important thing for us to revisit because similar to what Grace was just describing about the Federal Work Study Program, some of the assumptions and conditions that made that all make sense when we created our community college system aren't holding as much today. So just very quickly, if we go back in time, when community colleges were created, they sort of had a dual purpose. One was to sort of enroll students right out of high school who maybe weren't ready either academically or emotionally to go straight on to university. They didn't know what they wanted to do or they, they needed a little extra time to do some exploration. So community college was a place where they could take some courses and then transfer into a four-year institution if they wanted to complete that bachelor's degree. So the whole idea that this was a stopping point and a place to kind of polish people off, these were our junior colleges. They were also called that at that time. And then on the other hand, there was also a place, community colleges were a place where you could go to get degrees and certificates for jobs that didn't require a bachelor's degree. And they still are very much that. And so you, this is where you can get associate's degrees in nursing and accounting and, and other kinds of you know, shorter degrees, associate degrees or certificates, if you don't need to get a bachelor's degree. So those are two things that community colleges do. They continue to do them. They're very important. But some things have changed since uh, we created this system of community colleges and that are putting a lot of strain on that system. Two quick things are that many, many more students are starting their higher education in community colleges because they are affordable and they're accessible and they're nearby. In fact, 40% of undergraduates today are enrolled in our community colleges. According to surveys of community college students, upwards of 80% of them hope to finish a bachelor's degree. But here's the, here's, the, here's the problem, is that that transfer system doesn't really work very well. In fact, it, it works quite poorly. Right? According to the data from the National Student Clearinghouse, less than a third of community college students who enrolled in 2010 transferred successfully to a four-year institution, and of those who successfully transferred, only 42% completed their degree in six years. That's 13% of the starting cohort. And again, as I said, around 80% of students report that they would like to finish a bachelor's degree. Uh, those numbers are even lower for African American, Native American, and Latinx students who are also overrepresented in our community colleges. So we've set up a whole system that's designed around this two plus two. You start here, but you finish here. And the problem is, is that journey from the one institution to the other is sort of up to the student to complete, and it's very difficult to do. Okay? Some states are better than others, but in general, students lose a lot of credit often when they try to move. The other big change is that a lot more jobs require bachelor's degrees now. You know, when, when we created community colleges, there were a lot more jobs out there that you could get with just an associate's degree. Think about nursing, for example. You can continue, you can still become a registered nurse with an associate's degree, but increasingly colleges, or hospitals and healthcare providers are looking for bachelor degree nurses and bachelor degree nurses are now kind of the, uh, uh, being set as the kind of standard for the field, right? 
Um, this is true in healthcare and in, in, in across many fields, um, including tech, right, IT. I mean, you'll hear people say that you don't need a bachelor's degree uh, to get a really good job in tech, and that's just not true, okay? That is just not borne out by the data, and ask anybody from Seattle, and I think they'll tell you that. So. Our society has changed. We have a lot more students going into community colleges, starting their degree there. We have not figured out a good way to get them to the finish line seamlessly. Um, and the bachelor's degree is more important than it ever was before. So that brings us back to this question of like, well, why can't a community college deliver a bachelor's degree? Or is this like you know, chiseled into stone somewhere that they're not able to do that? Are the faculty at community colleges so different from the faculty at a four-year public university? Are the facilities so different that they really can't do that? And the answer is really no. They, what we're seeing in places like Washington and Florida is that they can deliver very high quality bachelor's degrees. Um, and they can do that in ways um, that allow students to start their, their bachelor's degree at a community college and finish it there. And so let's just think about what that means for students. Um, that means that a student can, again, begin and finish at the same institution without having to, to, to move over to another institution and find their degree. That transfer process is not just bad because of all the credit student lose, students lose, they also have to learn a way around a whole new institution, create new relationships with advisors and counselors, um, you know, and often in an institution that is not as organized around their particular needs as adult learners. So at New America, with our partners at the University of Washington, we've really been digging into these programs in Washington and Florida and trying to see, you know, is, is there some other part of the story that we should be holding up? You know, is there some, what, what are the downsides and things like that? So we'll be, and we're not seeing them, frankly, but we'll be publishing more of that research uh, uh, in, uh, in the next few months. But in the meantime, what we wanted to do with this piece was really sort of put a face on these programs of who are the students and who are the institutions and what are they doing for the communities where they serve. So we're gonna hear from those folks right now. So I'm gonna ask the panelists to come up um, and we're gonna have a little conversation around federal work study and community college bachelor's degrees. Okay. Oh, no, I guess I don't. Do I just keep using this? Okay. For some reason I thought, okay, good. How is everyone? All right. Okay, so I'm gonna do a couple of quick introductions. You, you, you've heard from Grace Gadai, an editor at the Washington Monthly. To my left, I have Melissa Curry, who is a program manager, storyteller, and producer at Microsoft. And I have, to her left, Joyce, Dr. Joyce Hammer, who is the vice president for instruction at Centralia College, and used to be at the state board of our community and technical colleges in the state of Washington. We're getting a lot of represents. You know, the state of Washington did not pay us off for this edition <laughs> of the college guide, but it is truly the better Washington today. There's no doubt about that. Okay, all right. So, uh, Melissa, I want to start with you um, because I had such a great conversation with you when I was out in Seattle about your experience at Green River College. Yeah. Um, I will say this, when community colleges start offering bachelor's degrees, they have to drop the word community from their name, which seems <laughs> crazy, but, but Green River College is historically a community college. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got there and how you got from there to Microsoft? Yeah, um, I was a casino dealer for 10 years and a single mom, I had them right out of high school, so college just kind of got delayed and I had always intended on going back and um, but just got comfortable and stuck with what I was doing and um, got laid off in 2012 and decided to leverage that as an opportunity to go back to school. Um, my son was in middle school at the time so Green River was close to his school so it made sense to go there. I can drop him off at school, go to school myself and then um, come back. I had the flexibility to you know take him to sports and go to his activities and stuff so it was just the best option. Um, I got my associates in IT networking and had planned on transferring to UW and getting my uh, bachelor's there at some point, but I knew I was gonna take a break and go to work for a while. Um, that didn't happen. I did some research and saw that not all my credits would be transferable, so. And then I started applying to jobs and um, was having a hard time finding a job in that area and got really lucky that um, I ran into Ken, my instructor in the hallway, and he told me about this work that they're doing to start this bachelor's degree in software development, and um, he would help me get enrolled, and so I just went for it, and I learned a, like a ton of different skills that I did not um, prepare myself for, or didn't think that I would learn. I was thinking, you know, computer science, software development, it's gonna be really um, like theory-based and super technical, and I had never written a line of code, and I was in my 30s, so it was um, terrifying, but 
Um, the small class size, we got a lot of attention, and I think that's, that helped me in my journey. I needed, um, any time that it seemed like I wasn't, um, you know, there was various times where I was having a difficult time with whether it was keeping up with homework or, you know, personal things that happened throughout the four years I was there. Um, they were very in tune with that, and so it was like, hey, Melissa, what's going on? How can I help? There was times I'd be in the, the tech center doing homework, 8 o'clock at night. Uh, my instructor's on their way out the door and see me and put their stuff down, sit down, and stay there for an extra two hours. And I, um, that, that attention, and um, I think it was really helpful and helped me get to the finish line um, several different times I thought I was going to have to quit. So, um, and how that helped me get to Microsoft, um, one of our instructors, his sister-in-law, worked at Microsoft, and she had a nonprofit where she helped women uh, prepare for technical interviews, and so he kind of like hooked me up with her, and, and I was offered a teaching position at Green River after I graduated. So that six months of teaching, um, it really cemented my learning in a different way, things I thought I knew I didn't know, like the, you know, just people ask you questions and make you think about things differently. So I think that really helped me. And then um, when we got to the first time I applied for the, it's called the LEAP program. Microsoft has this program where they uh, try to recruit people from non-traditional backgrounds that university recruiting doesn't have a presence in. Mm -hmm. And um, didn't get in my first time, but met with the guy who founded it. And he told me, you know, some stuff to work on. And um, I did that and ended up getting in. And now I see, like, all these things that we did during the, the four years at Green River. We did so many, like, meetups and um, mock interviews and different opportunities to speak and all these different things that I, I didn't see then like what the value was is once I got to Microsoft I'm like oh my gosh I'm so grateful like this I would have failed miserably and fell flat on my face and um, I got that opportunity to get the practice early on so great congratulations yeah. thank you um, yeah <laughs> um, so Joyce, you know, when, when we think about what is a good college, I mean, Melissa just graduated in four years, so we've got on-time graduation, um, leveraged networks within the institution to sort of get connected to one of our country's premier tech firms in a very competitive economy, and, um, and you know, has moved into a, a great job um, in, in the area. So seems to, you know, that sounds like a, the definition of a good college. But these programs are controversial, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you you sat there in the state board, and now you're at an institution. Can you and tell I was, us? I was at Green River before. <laughs> okay. So. Can you tell us a little bit about why these programs, you know, uh, there's only a few states that are really doing them at scale, Washington and Florida being the two. What, what is the pushback? Where does it come from? And, and, uh, and, and how did you all get through it in the state of Washington? So a uh, little bit of history in our state. Um, so we have a system of community and technical colleges, our 34 colleges, where it's a non-federated system. And um, so in 2004, we knew that there was a need for students who were not going to four-year institutions for bachelor's degrees. And we knew that we had a need in our, in, in our community to, to meet the job needs. So we asked the four-year institutions in our state, would you consider applied baccalaureate degrees? Um, we, our neighbors to the north in British Columbia had been doing this for years. We had Florida starting it up. And they really said no, um, that it, that wasn't where they wanted to focus. And so we said, OK, we're going to get going. And, and we rolled up our sleeves, and we started offering. Um, 2005 was our pilot year. And then we, it opened up. And we have our state board for community and technical colleges that actually approves these programs. So I think um, the real issue that we have faced is really centered around the communication piece. What are these degrees? What are they not? And so um, I was the director of transfer education at the state board. And so a lot of people would say, well, why are you taking these on? These are workforce degrees that build off of two-year workforce programs. Well, it was strategic because I was sitting at the table with provosts and vice provosts at the four-year institutions. So I could explain why these were intended to serve a population that would not be going to a four-year college. And so, um, so I think that was really what we embarked on was to, to that communication piece. The second thing we did was as part of our approval process is to require um, our four-year institutions in the state to be part of a peer review on the curriculum and the program. So it's faculty to faculty. So all of a sudden, the faculty at a four-year institution was seeing what these how they differed. 
Um, an example of that is we just had a program approved in health physics. I would have no idea what's health physics. Well, it's in, um, it's to prepare students for the nuclear technology field in Hanford in the Tri-Cities in our state. So those are kinds of things that I wouldn't even have known and that that communication of peer to peer uh, really played a significant role in helping us communicate. And then third, we're really talking about pathways. And it is opening up a pathway for students to even go into master's level programs. When we first started these programs, we heard a lot of no's. You will not, these students will not get jobs at the Microsofts of the world or the Googles. Well, guess what? They're getting jobs at Microsoft and Google. These students will not be able to go into master's programs. Well, we require our programs to have rigorous general ed requirements, and they are going into master's programs. So we got a lot of those no's, and um, we've been able to show with our data that these students really are finding success in, in the job market. And um, finally, when you talk about these students, you really do see that they are not even a student that feels like they can drive 20 miles to a neighboring um, institute, four-year institution. They really are place-bound. They're working during the day. They come from often poverty situations. We have. Um, a lot of our programs at our community and technical colleges are, are really focusing on closing equity and opportunity gaps. And those stu students feel those programs at our colleges and want to stay there to continue their path. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Grace, we um, probably, uh, there's not many students at uh, Green River College or Centralia College who get a lot of federal work study because the federal work study formula is crazy, right? <laughs> and uh, can you tell us a little bit about like how does that happen? How is it that the formula got so out of whack and that the money doesn't actually get, isn't actually targeted to the low income students? A little yeah. backstory on that? Yeah, certainly. So the first thing to know about work studies, it goes to schools, not to students. And then the schools kind of get to do what they want with it. Um, but the story of how it started kind of going to maybe not the right schools is a story of kind of policy failure that dates back to the 60s and just hasn't been corrected. So basically what happened in the 60s is that um, the government was like, here's all this money, schools come make your case to us for how much you need. And kind of the more elite private schools that had you know, more administrators um, and were really used to writing grant proposals did a really good job, and then there's also some evidence that they were inflating numbers <laughs> um, to kind of uh, support their inflated requests. So they got a lot of the money. Um, and then as some years went on and public schools and community colleges realized that there was this money out there that could be helping them, their students that they weren't getting, um, Congress kind of play, put that initial inequity into the policy and said, you know, you schools who applied first in the 60s, who were just the first at the, finish, at the start line, your allotments won't change much year to year. You're good. And the rest of schools who hadn't gotten any money yet, well, like, for you, as Congress adds more money, you can get access to some of that. So as it stands today, there's a pool of money, which is over half of the budget, which just goes to the same schools year after year. Um, like Harvard and Yale and schools, a lot of schools with really large endowments. And then the rest of the schools compete for the rest of the money. Um, and the thing is Congress just hasn't added that much money to the program. Um, so what that means is a, a wealthier student at a private school is actually more likely to get work study than a low income student at a public school, which is a mess. So. Um, as Congress considers reforming federal work study, I think figuring out how to change the distribution formula is a key thing to fix. And one, one good way of doing it would be based on the number of Pell students a school enrolls, but there are a lot of ways of fixing it. So yes, this is how policy gets made in the surreal Washington. <laughs> you're, you're, you're an institution with a, a multi-billion dollar endowment, and here's some more money. Yeah, so. Okay, let's go back to you, Melissa. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about your fellow students mm -hmm. and just the experience of going through the program. Um, I will say when, you know, when we heard your story, um, you know, when we were out at Green River, it's always like, yeah, but you know, 
Is that typical of what other students are like, or am I just going to be whole, you know, are you a yeah. unicorn? Can you tell me a little bit about like what your other stu what your your peers were mm -hmm. like in your program, and also, do you are you still in touch with them? Do you all have relationships with one another? Yeah. What's that been like? Um, so when we first started in the bachelor program, there was probably 20 of us, and okay. the program was like from day one working with real clients in the community. So. Um, from it was hard from day one and so we dropped like six people that first year so then there was about 14 of us for the rest of the time and it was you know a diverse set there was um, one other parent um, and then um, range of uh, ethnicities from several different countries and in a range of age some of the guys were there like right out of high school a couple years before that and then there was some of us were, we were career changers so it was mm -hmm. a really diverse mixed group of people mm -hmm. um, but we, we got really close because you're going through this rigorous program for two years together. Um, and you know the, the staff would facilitate um, like a room for us to do our projects and, and work in. So we'd be in, you know, go through classes together and then go spend eight hours like coding and working through solutions on the whiteboard. Um, so yeah, we got really close. We still talk, we meet a couple times a year. We'll go for happy hour or something like that. And we have a, a group chat that we all chat on. And so yeah, we three years later after graduation, we're all still pretty close. And has anybody else from Green River joined you at Microsoft? Yeah, yeah. so one of my cohort mates, um, she applied with me to the LEAP program to begin with, and she didn't get in, and uh, she just kept trying, and eventually she ended up getting like multiple offers from teams. So she, she was the second person to get in, um, and after her, we had three more Green River grads come through the LEAP program specifically mm -hmm. and get hired on at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, i say one of the sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, stories around community colleges, right, is that they are gigantic institutions and, and uh, you know, people can get really lost in them, and that is very true. Mm -hmm. But we're also seeing in programs like this that community colleges can be places where people build successful networks, again, a really important part of the college experience, and bring those networks into the labor market with them, into their companies, and build sort of bridges from their mm -hmm. institution in, into these, these great firms. So. I think these programs really disrupt a lot of what we think community colleges are, what they can do, and, and what, what is possible when you sort of open up the, 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 the possibilities for them to, to build these kind of new programs. So with that, Joyce, I'll go back to you. Um, um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna just put the question to you pointedly. So yeah, and you know, we're hoping switching it, it up. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna ask you. So you know, in in our in our reading, a lot of times four-year institutions think that this is a terrible idea, and a lot of states that are trying to pass legislation to allow their community colleges to offer bachelor's degrees, the the biggest uh, pushback comes from four-year public institutions. The state of Wyoming just is a recent case where they just passed a law and the University of Wyoming opposed the legislation. Why is, what's going on there and how do you manage that? Um, <clears throat> Not to put anybody on the spot here. <laughs> yeah. I've got my four-year partner here. Um, I, it's, in Washington, we've been luckier than I think other states. Um, one is our the flagship research universities in the state have been actually very supportive, and part of that is that they are have you know they they they're not able to take as many of our students, and so that's been helpful. Um, and the Evergreen State College has been very supportive because they understand the workforce nature of these degrees. Um, sometimes the regional um, universities have struggled because they have vacancies in some of their programs and slots, and so they're a little worried about, about that. But I, I keep harping back to the communication piece and the data that's now being produced. I mean, that's, that's been significant for us to show, you know, the need that this is having for our communities. Um, an example of this, too, is where uh, the workforce and um, one uh, is in teacher ed as an example. Um, our school districts have just really been struggling to find teachers, particularly in smaller towns, and to get diverse teachers into the ranks. And so this grow your own idea has emerged. And so we've embarked, we have six of our community and technical colleges have teacher ed applied baccalaureate degree programs. And it's because of this need. And so that's, that has been um, a struggle, too, mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to define what that is. But we're 
It, we have one at Centralia College, and we're showing a map of where these students are going. We put a little pin, and it's all in the Lewis County region, and so it's, it's serving the need of, of, of those. So, so I think one of getting those, the student story out there, getting the employers out there to say we need more highly trained employee, employees, mm -hmm. um, getting school districts, if teacher ed is one of the, uh, one of the you know, degrees that you're pursuing. We've also had a lot of um, uh, organizations in the Puget Sound region that are saying, look, if we're going to meet our goals for baccalaureate degree attainment, the higher ed system has to have the community and technical colleges play a part in that, or well, we will not reach those goals. And so that's also been a, a, an important message. But overall, I would say we, we have fared fairly well. Um, and, but it is interesting, Oregon just signed on to mm -hmm. adopt um, applied baccalaureate degrees. So they're calling us um, on you know, phones off the hook because they're, they're interested in, in how to get this started as well. But um, just yeah. don't go to California. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, and I, one more thing yeah. to add on the quality and rigor of the programs, we have the same, and California does not have this. We have the same accrediting body, nor our Northwest Commission for accrediting um, our programs. So we can always talk to that. We have the same accreditation process. Mm -hmm. So that really has also helped us with the rigor piece. Mm -hmm. So Grace, we were hearing a little bit about from Melissa what it was like to go through this program, and I know you talked to some students who were on, who received federal work study or were in federal work study jobs. Can you share with us a little bit like what those programs meant to them and and, and those jobs? Yeah, absolutely. So when I was writing this uh, feature for the Washington Monthly's College Guide, I talked to about a dozen students um, doing work study jobs at different colleges to kind of hear about their experience, um, and there were a lot of themes that end up being really uh, kind of important for shaping my understanding of what was good about it and bad about it. And I think on the theme we've been talking about like meeting, meeting students where they're at, one kind of important part of especially work study that gets overlooked sometimes is how different, like the different needs of underclassmen versus upperclassmen. So mm -hmm. for a four-year student, what the type of job you want when you're a freshman and a sophomore is pretty different from what you're looking for as an upperclassman. So what I heard a lot from students was that it was really nice when they were a freshman and just like didn't really know what they were interested in studying, was really, they were really intimidated by college, like didn't know anyone to have access to a job on campus, which put them in touch with more students mm -hmm. and staff um, and kind of got them connected to, they made them even more likely to use kind of like the Office of Financial Aid and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but as they kind of figured out what they might be interested in pursuing and kind of gained confidence and just more subject area knowledge, they're more interested in, in getting off campus. And especially for the DC-based students I talked to, who attended, some of which attended these kind of very internship-focused schools by their you know, junior and senior year, they were doing unpaid internships in addition to their on-campus work study jobs, which just kind of illustrates how there's a better way to marry the um, you know, better align with student interests because that's a lot to that's a lot to be juggling. Um, so yeah, I'd say that's like three jobs at once. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Great. Great. So how about some questions from the audience? Uh, yeah. Oh, great, Cassie. We can start it with you. Yeah. Please do. Do we have a Do we have somebody with a the microphone there? Oh, sorry. Yep. Sorry, I sort of sprung that on you. Yeah. Here, here it comes. Uh, right up here in the front. Cassie. Thank you for talking about this. Um, I have a question. I, I think it can kind of go out to everyone. When I was an undergrad, I was a work study recipient, and I was actually able to use it as a tutor with TRIO. I don't know if you guys know what TRIO yeah, is, sure. but it is um, a tutoring and mentorship program for students who are first gen or underrepresented communities. I'm like wondering if you're seeing opportunities like that where you can kind of combine programming that helps students in effective ways and if you saw any of that and how that could help at a community college level as well. Yeah, so I think that's, that's a really interesting point and it's one of those things that's just so different school to school. So community service was supposed to be a core part of work study when it was created. Mm -hmm. Um, and schools still do that and actually are required to do that, but it's, I think a lot of schools no longer think of it as the focus of the program, which is probably a real loss because I think there are some 
great ways that students can help other students on campus. Um, so yeah, some, some schools have really kind of built out programs for work study students to do kind of volunteer like positions or kind of service oriented work. And at other schools, that's really underdeveloped. So um, there are different kind of ways that schools could like take away best lessons if they were interested in doing that. Um, and there's also ways that governments, like the government could offer more incentives, but um, it, wasn't, it wasn't the focus of my story, but I think it's really important. And it's cool that you had that opportunity. <laughs> Um, I w sometimes we forget to look at how these degrees, uh, applied baccalaureate degrees, have helped the community and technical college itself. So it's beefed up the library program. It has added a lot of other resources to the college that would otherwise be there. It has provided an opportunity for faculty to start thinking about, you know, qualified faculty to start thinking about teaching at the three and four hundred level which is rejuvenating a lot of careers. So one of the other areas is work-based learning experiences. Um, and so that is something that we have in Washington, a really big push. We have this career launch that's trying to get more students into work-based learning. And so with our capstone projects and, and different opportunities, we're seeing students in our applied baccalaureate degrees working on our campuses, but also working outside as well. And, and that's been something too with research is another, um, at, coming from the transfer world, a lot of four-year universities are having students do more research early on. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's not been equitable for transfer students. They haven't had those opportunities. So now we're seeing the conversation around how do we get our students to have more research opportunities as well. So it's it really has beefed up, I guess, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. um, some of the, the, the offerings for students at our colleges. Yeah, we, I applied for federal work study and wasn't awarded it, but um, the, the staff at my school then just, they came up with the budget to pay me to tutor. So I was able to still tutor for pay and stay on campus, which was really helpful. And I think that they also use work study in the same budget maybe for um, the, the help desk is run by students. And so they um, use that as an opportunity to get them experience and um, use their work study there too. And I will just say, just because I'm contractually obligated to talk about <laughs> apprenticeship, uh, because that is another uh, big part of our portfolio. But, um, but we actually have looked at ways to leverage the federal work study program to allow people to do apprenticeships, formal work-based learning experiences, and what's nice about them as opposed to internships is that in an apprenticeship, there's actually structured learning happening. And there's like an actual curriculum and a structured learning going on so that part of the degree that you're earning, you're actually earning while you're learning at work. And so federal, we're thinking about ways that to leverage federal work study for that. But all of these programs could be updated a little bit more to, to really meet students where they are and allow them to, to put different things together, uh, learning opportunities together to advance towards a degree. So we've got a question back here, and then we've got two over here. So one, I'm going to start, and we'll go up. Great. Um, I'm Deborah Bragg. I'm the co-author of um, this piece with Mary Alice. Um, we've been talking about college costs and affordability a lot today. I wonder, if, Melissa, if you could share with us from your perspective um, the value of the degree in terms of what it cost you. Mm -hmm. um, and from your perspective, Joyce, could you talk about how the state thinks about pricing these baccalaureate degrees? Um, because there is a criticism that this is a way for community colleges to generate revenue and actually increase tuition and fees. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a lot of thought that goes into that. So I'd like to hear both your perspective. I'm, I can't say exactly what the price was compared to like if I were to go to UW. Um, I know that there was a difference, but I can't remember what that difference was. Um, it, it was more than what it was during my associate's degree. I know that that went up and um, I was lucky that I got a scholarship from the National Science Foundation, which helped me um, fill that, that gap and attend, continue attending. Um, I don't believe it was as my son's in university now, and it's really expensive, so I don't think it was the same. <laughs> and you're right. Yeah. It is uh, <laughs> different. So we, we charge the average of the regional um, university tuition rate. And, um, and we did that intentionally when we were um, authorized to offer applied baccalaureate degrees. We didn't want to be so less expensive that that was unfair to four years with similar programs. 
but we also wanted to make an affordable option for students. Um, and so we also only charge that tuition rate for three and 400 level classes. So if they're taking um, a mixture of one 200 level and three 400, they're only charged the higher rate for the three and 400. Um, so it is, a, it is affordable option, though comparable to the regionals. We're very mindful. Um, this is an investment for our colleges. It takes four to five years to see any return on that investment and that most colleges when they get a, a revenue stream after four or five years are then needing to put back into the program. So I think of IT at Green River, that's where they have to upgrade equipment, et cetera. And so we're, we wa this is the advantage of having a, a state system is that at the state, when I was at the state board, we were watching this closely because we didn't want this to be about money making. Um, we do have the colleges now all count the FTEs as state FTEs. So they have to be, you know, be in, in, under our policies around that. And so, um, so yes, we're, because we're very careful about legislation. We don't want legislators to also um, come out and say, wait a minute, um, we need more regulation around this. So we're, we're very mindful of that and, uh, and careful. Yeah. Great. So I think we had a question here. Yeah. Hi, Hunter Martin. I'm a reporter with the National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators. Can you talk a little bit about if students at these community colleges now offering bachelor degrees have access to federal loans and how you're kind of dealing with the potential like higher default rates with those populations if they don't finish their degrees? Well, I'll just quickly answer. At Centralia College, we're the only college in the state of Washington that does not do loans. And I think we might even be on the West Coast. Wow. <laughs> um, so because we live in a, in a community that's very um, high poverty rate, um, we are very mindful of that. Um, it's, it's a concern, though, because there, um, there are students that would need, rely on that who are not um, getting the need. We also have a state, Washington grant, too, that helps fill in a gap for uh, students um, with Pell. Um, and so, but we're mindful of, of that, and, and so that hasn't been an issue. We do have to offer a lot of programs at night to make sure we can meet the needs of, of working adults. Yeah, and I'll just say, that's a great question, and it's something definitely to be pay paying close attention to. I will say, in the data we're looking at so far from Washington and Florida, we're seeing pretty high graduation rates. So the graduation rates for students in these applied baccalaureates don't mirror the graduation rates of two, you know, students entering um, at community colleges, which is, of course, extremely low. Um, but it is a really interesting point and probably something we should be paying closer our, attention our to. Our fall to fall retention across our state is at 92%. Yeah, wow, wow, okay. So for, these, for those programs. For applied yeah. baccalaureate degree yeah. programs. But not for community colleges generally. Okay, and then we had a question here. I'm Frank Palmer with NASCAP, and you, you raised some good points about reallocating who gets work-study funding at colleges. And like Cassie, I had a great work-study job when I was in college, but lately there's been stories about work-study students cleaning the bathrooms in the dorms of their uh, fellow students, and a college where work-study is used to pay students less than minimum wage to work in the cafeteria. So do you think reauthorizers need to look at also what is an eligible work study job? Um, yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, and you know, it's it's a very tricky thing to figure out. And I'm not sure if the federal government is saying you can't have people checking IDs in gyms, but you can have people working in the financial aid office. Like that may not be the way to do it. But um, I think coming up for like maybe come up with guidelines for what what makes what counts for a work study job is is um, potentially important because it's it's partially a financial aid program, but it's also should be you know a job skills program, and um, the students are already doing the jobs, but not that much attention is being paid to the skills they could be getting, um, and so I think policymakers definitely need to pay attention and be intentional about like what what skills do the students want to get out of this, and how do we align it with their interests and help them get ready to move into a job post-grad. 
Yeah, and I'll say more. At, you know, I mean, this is a billion dollar program, which means it's a billion dollar program for subsidized employment, right? And it's very funny, I come from more from the, you know, I come from the Department of Labor and the workforce side of the house, and securing dollars to be able to support subsidized employment is incredibly difficult. But if you put it in the Higher Education Act, mm -hmm. suddenly it's all like, oh no, this is a great idea. And, you know, but again, you have to follow what is that subsidizing bad behavior? And, and it is important for regulators to be looking at that. You're absolutely right. Because these are jobs at the end of the day. Yeah. Any other questions out there? Oh, yeah. Um, Iris Palmer from New America. Um, Joyce, I was wondering, I know I, I'm not that familiar with the way the state uh, funds their higher education or their, their community colleges in Washington, but I was wondering, do they have a different reimbursement rate for upper division courses? So do you get paid more for upper division courses that are probably more expensive to offer since you also charge sort of a differential tuition? So I was just wondering how that works. Um, oh, that's a, a good question. Um, I, I, yeah, um, I believe, I don't think we, so we don't get reimbursed from the state for the specific um, courses we offer. Um, we get an allocation to our community and technical college system, and then we um, allocate out to our 34 community and technical colleges. And so um, within our allocation model, um, the cost per FTE might change based on, on the, what the students are, are taking, but that each college is you know, reimbursed for that amount. Um, yeah, so, so it's, it's a different model. We have a big allocation pot that we work off of that's really not dependent as much on FTEs. It's, it, but actually, in our allocation model, we do um, have some waiting for colleges who are offering applied baccalaureate degrees. So there is an incentive. It's very small, but it is, it is in there to encourage colleges to, to think about applied baccalaureate degrees. In the very beginning, when we did our pilot program, there was an earmark from the legislature for a startup. Um, to offer these degrees, but we no longer have that. So it's really up to our colleges to work within our allocation model. Yeah. Looks like we've got a question way in the back there, and this maybe that the last, and you'll have the last question. Carl Strickward, uh, previous uh, president of Elizabethtown College. Has there been any choices, particularly for you, is there any pressure to try to expand beyond that limited range of applied degrees that, that you have been successful with, and what's What's the political discussion about that? And when you say expand, in what way? Okay, well, I mean, I was uh, most previously in Pennsylvania, and there was a push there for some community colleges to go beyond uh, sort of like technical degree, four-year degrees and to move into a range of things, biology, uh, engineering, those kinds of things. So uh, yeah, that has, there's been a little bit of talk about that, but it, we, as a system, have very much made it clear. In our statutory authority, it says very much, you know, that it has to build off of two-year workforce professional technical programs. So, um, you know, every once in a while we'll get somebody talking about that, but we as a state system have really um, pushed back on that. And in fact, our, um, the fact that we have a Bachelor of Applied Science in all of our titles, Florida does not. They have BA or BS. We have Bachelor of Applied Science. That was an agreement we made with our four-year institutions to keep that applied clear. Um, we also have like business management. It's applied business management. Education is teacher education, so we're really mindful of crossing into a territory that we shouldn't go at this point. Um, we, uh, yeah, so we, we are also careful about marketing. Um, we have a, if I would advise any state considering offer these, that you have a, a, a group. We have a baccalaureate leadership council. It sounds like BLT, but it's council. <laughs> we had a little fun with that. But, we, um, it's representative of each college, and, and that's a policy support group that helps inform these um, as, as problems arise. But they also helped work on some marketing guidelines because it's so easy for a college that has somebody who just came in and doesn't understand the nuances of these degrees to say, hey, come 
take this two year, you know, this four year degree and not use the right words to, to carefully describe the program. So we're mindful of that. It, you know, I think if anything, um, I, you know, I don't know if applied math, you know, I think we're looking more, it's even the four years are considering more applied degrees because they can offer them too. We only have one Central Washington University is offering an applied bachelor's degree, but they're also welcome to offer those. So I could see more of that happening. Yes, this is the Washington where careful, thoughtful policy is made <laughs> by, by strong <laughs> state systems. It's beautiful, isn't it? It could be, it could be something. Okay, I'm gonna ask the panel, any final words, any, anything anybody wanted to say that they didn't get a chance to get out or it didn't come out in a question that you wanna share? No pressure if you don't. Yeah. Okay. All right, should we give a hand to our panel? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you closing us out?